for the meetings for now. Ah, thanks, Carrie. You're welcome. So I'll call the meeting to order and um, read the opening statement as follows. Pursuant to section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place of this meeting has been given to prominently, excuse me, by prominently posting the 2020 resolution of the regularly scheduled meetings of the Planning Board of Princeton. A copy was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on the 8th day of December, 2019. Legal notice on the adoption of said resolution appeared in the December 20th, 2019 edition of the Princeton Packet. Notice of this meeting has been filed with the Clerk of Princeton on the 8th day of April and has been posted to the municipal website, princetonnj.gov meetings and choose the planning tab to view. Pursuant to Executive Order 107, due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19, the coronavirus, notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Planning Board will be held electronically via Zoom, was transmitted to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, and The Times, and was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on the 8th day of April, 2020. Such notices have been placed on the official bulletin board at the Princeton Municipal Complex and on the Princeton website and are to be maintained throughout the year. Notices have also been placed on all windowed doors of the Municipal Complex. For members of the general public, please note that as with regular in-person meetings, members of the public will have an opportunity at specific points in the proceedings to comment and ask questions. Please be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Those wishing to comment orally should virtually raise their hand using the button at the bottom center of your Zoom screen, or if you're participating by phone, by pressing star nine. Oral comments will be taken in the order in which hands were raised. For those who do offer comments, we ask you please do your best to keep your comments to roughly three minutes or less, and that you activate the camera on your device so that the board and other meeting participants and attendees may see you. If you don't know how to do that, we can guide you through it. Inappropriate public comment containing obscenity, hate speech, or relating to matters not before the board will be immediately muted. If you're having difficulty accessing this feature, use the Q&A dialog box for assistance. Um, we might not have public comment in this meeting tonight. I'm not, I'm, Absolutely certain of that, but I read those paragraphs anyway. <laughs> Carrie, would you please call the roll? Ms. Capizzoli? I'm here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Mr. McGowan? Here. Mr. O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Quinn? Here. Ms. Sachs? Here. Mr. Texarney? Here. Mr. Chow? Here. And Mrs. Wilson? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, just a reminder first, we have a special meeting of the planning board scheduled for next Thursday, the 22nd, one week from tonight. Um, next week's meeting will begin at 6.30 and um, will be the planning board's first review of the Avalon Bay Thanet Road redevelopment site plan and subdivision. Um, all applicant material for that is available for review electronically on the Princeton website. Go to the planning board. You can go through a planning board link or planning board applications link. Um, and secondly, uh, regarding one of the hearings on tonight's agenda, Thaddeus Pronell, the 17 Witherspoon Street property, the meeting notices for this application were insufficient, and so that application will be postponed uh, until an upcoming meeting. We're tentatively thinking November 5th for that, um, but that is not yet nailed down. Are there any other announcements from board members or staff? Yeah, I'd like to make, if I can. Um, sure. I know there are a number of, um, members of the public who are uh, attendees. And I just wanna ask the members of the public, uh, and this relates to any application, to please don't um, send written communications or otherwise contact board members about an application. 
all communications uh, have to be within the confines of the hearing itself. And I have advised the board, uh, bo that the board members, that if they do get any written uh, uh, communications, uh, they should not read them. Um, and if uh, somebody wants to speak to meet with them, they should not meet with them, uh, even if it's kind of gratuitous in a meeting that they happen to bump into each other at McCaffrey's. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the, on the record. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Any other announcements before we get started? Okay, we have three sets of minutes. Um, first, the regular meeting from April 16th, 2020. Um, I did uh, contact the, the planning office with just a few edits, I don't think to this particular meeting, but to um, the other minutes. Were those received, Carrie? Yes, I received everything. Okay. Um, so as to these April minutes, uh, would someone like to move them? If there so are no moved. comments or questions. Thanks, Mr. McGowan. Is there a second? Julie Capazzolio, second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Okay. Um, the next minutes are from <clears throat> May 7th, 2020. Are there any comments? I found, I found a correction needed. Um, I have Ms. Sachs' name spelled incorrectly as an attendee, so I'll correct that. Thank you. More Saks Fifth Avenue stuff, Mia. <laughs> We're going uh, out of business. If there are no comments or other corrections, uh, will someone move them, please? I'll move them. Second. Moved by, was that Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Seconded by Mr. Quinn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? OK. And then the third set of minutes is from June 4th, 2020. Any comments or corrections? Uh, would someone like to move them? I'll, uh, Julie Capzoli, I'll move to approve. Second. Thank you. Uh, moved by Ms. Capazzoli, seconded by Mr. Quinn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Okay. Thank you. Um, Next, we have a hearing, Princeton Academy of the Sacred Heart. This is a minor site plan with variances and a conditional use uh, located at 1128 Great Road, block 301, lots 33, excuse me, lots three and 55. File number P2020844PM slash CO. Um, MLUL 1029. 20. Does that mean, um, pause and scammer, <laughs> is that the date by which ordinarily we would have heard the whole thing or is that a deadline? Yeah, that's a, de that's a deadline. Um, and we'd have to get an extension of time if, if um, we're not going to address the application tonight. Okay. Um, Mr. Muller, can you can you speak to proper notice and jurisdiction? Yes. Uh, first, I ask Carrie uh, whether um, she could confirm that the proof of publication and service are in order. Everything is in order, yes. Okay. Then uh, proof of publication and service and the notice itself are in order and the board has jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, representing P Princeton Academy? Or I, I guess I should... Mr. Laplace, do you want to go first or do we go straight to Mr. Ridolfi? I think in these circumstances, we should go straight to Mr. Ridolfi. Okay, thank you. Go right ahead, Mr. Ridolfi. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board and, and staff. Uh, for the record, uh, I'm Bob Ridolfi. I'm the attorney for Princeton Academy of the Sacred Heart. Uh, this applicant, as you know, this is a, we've submitted our application package for conditional use uh, approval minor site plan approval, and one uh, small bulk uh, variance. The application materials were reviewed um, by SPRAB and recommended with SPRAB with conditions on September 9th. <clears throat> 
since that time, I was just very recently contacted by an attorney representing several neighbors who uh, plan to object to our, our application. Um, rather than proceed tonight, I'm going to ask the board to just take in jurisdiction to carry this matter to your next regularly scheduled meeting when you can uh, schedule us. Uh, we feel, based on my conversations with the attorney, uh, and I also had a, a nice chat with the attorney for the um, Stony Brook Watershed, Watershed Association uh, late this afternoon, uh, we would like the opportunity to supplement our application uh, with additional data uh, and environmentally um, friendly um, mechanisms that we feel would uh, facilitate the, uh, the hearing uh, at a later date rather than start tonight uh, with some of the uh, witnesses that I have lined up and then continue on at a, uh, a second meeting because I firmly believe that this is not going to, uh, uh, it's not going to be completed in one hearing. I think for cont continuity sake, um, I'd rather have you see all the data that we have submitted and then begin our presentation in a more orderly fashion. We also have one of our witnesses who unexpectedly is not available tonight to uh, help us with our presentation and he will be available at your, at your next uh, meeting. So for those reasons, I would respectfully request that uh, you carry the meeting to your, whenever you can schedule us next and we not be required to re-notice or um, republish in the uh, Trenton Times that I have done already. Okay. Um, Ms. Phillip, do you have a sense of um, when we might have room on a future agenda um i, I was looking everything over today and i do have a date we can consider i didn't know if mr Rodolfi um wanted something that is so far from today's date we we can put you on for a december meeting we are really busy in the month of november and i don't think we can fit you in so is december 10th acceptable at the board's pleasure Okay. Uh, is that the meeting date itself or the following date? Uh, I don't right. know. We need an extension of time date. Yeah, we would need an extension of time until the day after that. So that would be December 11th. Okay. Would you prefer to provide that in writing by email or just consent to it right here and now? I need something in writing for the file. So I can send you a letter tomorrow or you can just send me an extension right now. All right. If, if, if I may, just to advise the public then, the meeting is being carried to December 10th. There's not going to be any further notice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and thank your team, and uh, we'll see you in December. And um, uh, thank you for engaging the neighbors and working ahead of time to um, address concerns. Um, David, can you please address some of the answer, the question and answers uh, section? I just want to make this clear so we can move on. I will. Uh, I mean, basically, we have uh, a few open questions, which are as follows. Will we be able to cross-examine the witnesses Please explain how we can bring up our concerns. We notice to the neighbors is important. So I think that um, uh, maybe Mr. Muller should each of those yeah. uh, concerns. I'm sorry, two more questions. I would ask that new documents be filed at least 10 days before the next meeting. And I am unclear whether the hearing will be on December 10th or 11th. I can answer that one. <laughs> we'll be on the 10th. Okay. And just to explain the process, um, assuming everything doesn't get resolved and it doesn't sound like it will be, hopefully the issues will be narrowed. Um, the applicant through their attorney will put on their case. They'll have a, a, several experts, I expect, who will testify. Members of the public, either through an attorney or if they're not represented by an attorney themselves, will have the right to cross-examine the, um, the witnesses testifying for the applicant. When the applicant's case is finished, um, and actually 
it will start with, with Michael Laplace kind of laying out um, what the matter is all about. After the applicant's case is finished, we'll open it up to the public and the members of the public um, can, can give comments and express their concerns. And again, they could do that through an attorney. And if they're not represented by an attorney, do it themselves. Now, apropos of what I mentioned at the outset in terms of written documents, um, occasionally we'll get a matter where uh, a member of the public will come in with a petition signed by 75 people. The case will make it very clear that that is not, cannot be accepted by the board because the board members and the uh, applicant's uh, attorney would have a right to, to cross-examine anybody who signed the petition. So if it, rather than signing the petition, they should come and testify themselves. Um, but that's basically how to work. If you, want to, if you want to retain some experts of your own and put them on, you have the right to do that as well um, th through the attorney that's, that's retained. And um, it, were there any other, th were there things I did not cover, David? There was a, uh, an assertion that re-notice to the neighbors is important. Okay, what I would suggest, and, and it's, it's up to Mr. Rodolfi and the, the, uh, the Princeton Academy, um, you know, rather than a certified mail um, notice, if you want, you can send a courtesy uh, re-notice uh, by, by letter form to everybody on the, on the service list. But that, that would be your choice. Understood. And then there's this request that new documents be filed at least 10 days before the next meeting. Um, yeah, is that that's a requirement not, or? Well, well, we basically require that. And there's guidance from, from the uh, Division of Local Government Services that says that should be done. Okay. And, and basically the MLU, MLUO really requires that as well. So that means that any you know, changes to the plans and new um, uh, site plans and materials would be posted on the municipal website by December 1st? Is that what we're committing to? Yes. Okay. Is there any anything else, uh, Mr. Cohen in the- that, That's it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Princeton Academy, and we will um, and and those of you um, who tuned in uh, to hear this application, we will see and hear you in December. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Everyone else. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. So next is the hearing that was postponed. Um, and so we are, next up is the concept plan from the trustees of Princeton University carried from October 1st. This is the School of Engineering and Applied Science and Environmental Studies buildings. Um, the agenda notes Faculty Road and Prospect Avenue. This is more specifically a project extending along the north side of Ivy Lane. Um, and uh, touching prospect in a couple of places too. It's block 50.01, lot 18, file number P2020-872C. Madam Chair, right. if I can interrupt for just a moment, there are two individuals in the attendees list, Tom O'Shea and uh, Rich Goldman. Um, I'm wondering, uh, they're often members of the university's team. Should they be brought in as panelists? Chris? Um, I, I think if, if we need them, we'll pull them in. I think we have a lot of people here already, so I don't want to have too many videos. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, though. I appreciate it, David. Sure. Mr. Laplace, do you have anything to say first? or? Yes, I'll, I'll get us started this evening. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. Chair. Yeah, and if, um, and if I oh, met, I'm sorry, Mr. Muller. Oh, yes. what, I was, what, I was, what I was going to say, because this is only concept review, it's not a formal hearing. I'm not, I, I'm not going to swear anybody in. But I'll still yeah. tell the truth, I promise. <laughs> Absolutely. I always do. Me okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Um, what we have before us this evening for concept review is another major component of the university's evolving East Campus, which we've all become very familiar with over there the course of the several months, a lot of activity going on in this part of town. Um, it, 
The site, um, as the chair had stated, is along the northerly side of Ivy Lane, and it'll be the new home to the Environmental Studies and also the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, if you can picture the site um, along the north, it's across from Princeton Stadium, and it's south of some of the eating clubs along uh, Prospect. And um, going from east to west, there's a building five Ivy Lane that would be replaced by this project, as well as a southerly section of the Ivy Club, which will be the subject of a subdivision. And then there's surface parking lots owned by the university. And then there's the um, Ferris Thompson apartments. Those will all be replaced by this new complex. Uh, the new complex will be basically two connected buildings. One of the buildings will house environmental studies and a commons area, a commons facility for students and faculty. And then the other building will be the new home of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, it, the site is located both within the E2 education zone of the former borough and the E1 education zone of the former township, and it is a permitted use. So I guess that sets the stage for what we're going to hear tonight, which is a concept review of what's going into this location. And I did want to note that the site is not within a designated historic district. However, it is just south of Prospect Avenue, which is um, an eligible historic district, because obviously because of the architecture along that street and the uh, physical characteristics of the street itself. So with that, I'll... I'll uh, Pass it along to the university. Thank you. Grazia, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Michael. Michael always pretty much covers everything that I'm going to say <laughs> all the time. Um, but I, I would say, um, for the record, I'm Christopher DeGrezia, representing trustees of Princeton University. Um, as you probably all recall, we were here before the board in January to present a concept for the East Campus, which Michael spoke about already. And essentially that's the area east of the uh, football stadium. Tonight, we're gonna shift um, a little bit north. Um, two, I guess it's two weeks ago now, we had the application for the East Campus garage, which was the first site plan that dealt with a component of the East Campus concept plan. Um, during that hearing, we talked about a few things or alluded to what will be occurring just north of the site, such as the removal of some parking lots, a connector road, and as Michael indicated, this would be the area or the home for environmental studies and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, so with that, I'd like to get right into the application, um, not the application, but because it's concept review, but right into the presentation. And I would like to invite up university architect, Ron McCoy, who I see on the screen. Yes, I'm ready to start. Uh, I need to be given permission to share a screen by the host. Gary, can you make that happen or is that within your powers? Just did it, thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, trusting you can see that. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, so tonight we want to, um, as has been said by Mr. Laplace and by Christopher, introduce you to the uh, concept plan for the, the new neighborhood for environmental studies and the School of Engineering and Applied Science. So I'm gonna begin and, and walk us through the site and then obviously we'll have time for uh, comments and questions. Uh, I'm gonna begin with a, just a refresher of the 2026 campus plan, which is posted on the university website and uh, available to review. Um, in that plan, there are the, the primary um, uh, strategic priorities of the university are identified as what's called elements. Um, in addition to the new residential colleges, which are under construction south of Poe Field, the, uh, the, the second priority identified in that document was a new neighborhood for or new facilities for environmental studies, which brings together the three existing departments, ecology and evolution of biology, Princeton Environmental Institute and geosciences. Those departments come together leave the existing building that they're in in Gill Hall and, uh, we're, and uh, occupy the building that we're calling environmental studies. 
uh, the other occupants uh, or the other facilities are for uh, the School of Engineering. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at here. And I just wanted to flag that this is um, one of the top priorities of the university. Um, and um, as with all of our all of our projects, the, uh, the, can, the planning principles that are identified here uh, are broad overarching goals that we try to, we keep in mind as we think about the projects. And so these talk about the mission uh, to support our uh, environment of teaching, uh, learning and research. They talk about uh, maintaining, enhancing and stewarding our distinctive sense of place. They talk about creating uh, welcoming and supportive settings for interaction and exchange, designing in uh, ways that are climate responsible and serving the communities that extend beyond the, the boundaries of the campus and all those principles you'll see at work uh, as we talk about this project. Uh, just a bit of the overview. So uh, uh, the uh, site boundaries have been described by Mr. Laplace and this diagram shows within that yellow dashed line the site for, for the project. I, I point out it includes Roper Lane. We'll talk a little bit about that. And it also includes um, enhancements and a bit of reconfiguration of Ivy Lane and Western Way. And we'll talk about that. At the Eastern border, it goes to the property line behind uh, the houses that are on uh, Fitzstrandolph in addition to some additional houses that are behind, it's sort of a second layer behind some of that. Um, with all of our projects, we uh, anchor them in a value proposition uh, that is a promise of what we're going to deliver through the facility. And so this does, uh, there's some, some highlighted bullets here that I wanted to emphasize because these will come into play as, as we talk about the, the project. Um, it is a gateway uh, to a new neighborhood for environmental studies and the School of Engineering. Uh, we want to achieve distinct identities for the different elements of that. Uh, fundamentally, we want to promote and enable breakthrough research for, in state-of-the-art facilities. This is much less of an expansion and more a, a rebirth of, uh, of programs, of, of space for the, that serves the programs. Um, many of these, these uh, um, disciplines have been working in buildings that were designed in the 60s or, or after, and those facilities are, are out, outdated. They're not flexible, they're not functional. And so this is a, uh, an opportunity to reset uh, with a new set of spaces, the kind of functionality and opportunity for research and teaching. We'll talk about um, diversity and collaboration across community, across the disciplines with a strong sense of community and interactions. And those, those two bullets will talk about the, the desire to make these, these uh, departments contiguous in the uh, fabric of the, of the, of the uh, uh, buildings that stretch across the site. We'll introduce um, the overview of our sustainability strategies that fit into our um, the campus plan sustainability uh, initiatives as well as the uh, climate action plan at the university. And we'll talk about things of, uh, uh, about nature, light, views, landscape, and flexibility. To orient you on the site plan here, um, you can see Ivy Lane Western Way at the lower part. You see Roper Lane and Prospect Avenue up at the top, Washington Road uh, on the left. Um, the Environmental Studies Building um, is, um, well, all the buildings are uh, stretched across a rather linear site uh, from uh, the west at Center for Jewish Life over to the eastern boundary of the site. And uh, we actually think that that's a, a fortuitous situation because it, it uh, pushes us toward buildings that are uh, thinner than some research laboratory buildings want to be. Um, and those that the kind of thinness and the variety of shapes, the irregular pattern, almost picturesque composition is in keeping with Princeton traditions of um, uh, capturing uh, semi-enclosed space uh, between linear buildings and linking those, those landscapes throughout the site. And through those linked landscapes, we're able to connect down to Ivan in the Western Way, which is really should be seen as a spine or a heart of the project. But you can see those landscapes extending to the east and reaching up to the northeast corner where they arrive on, on Prospect Avenue. So much like the existing campus, this is a, a sort of linear arrangement of buildings that are arranged in a, in a uh, landscape that has a lot of variety and supports the kind of community and interaction that we want to create. Um, to the uh, East of the Collins building, uh, you'll see the um, part of the, the first part of the School of Engineering facilities. That's a, a new building for uh, bioengineering. 
we'll call that bio e and there's a bridge connection between that and another building for the school of engineering uh, which is chemical and biological engineering i'll often refer to that as, as cbe uh, in between and in front of all that and facing onto Ivy Lane and Western Way is a facility that we call the Commons. And that's a, a shared um, academic resource. Uh, it, re it, it will uh, host uh, the uh, library for engineering, a kind of 21st century library that provides uh, learning resources, visualization labs, private study space, um, uh, and a, a, a range of, uh, of uh, study spaces that will serve the students throughout the um, engineering complex, the environmental studies complex, but also the university uh, at large. And you'll see that Commons in particular is surrounded by, uh, by landscapes at all different levels. There's also within the Commons a uh, social space, uh, a cafe and a kind of gathering space that, you'll, that we find in some of our buildings. Some of them are small, some of them are large. This will be on the larger side. Uh, so it can host uh, the kind of population of people who will occupy this part of the site. At the southeast part of the site, you'll see this dashed area called Future uh, Development Area. That is um, anticipated to be a new home for electrical engineering, which will also move down from the existing uh, engineering complex and would occupy that site there and, and begin to form a quadrangle with BioE and, and uh, CBE. If I just look at the landscapes, uh, I've, I've talked about how Ivy Lane and Western Way will be a sort of spine to the neighborhood, a pedestrian friendly and bicycle friendly complete street. There'll be an arrival plaza here for environmental studies uh, with um, multiple entrances. There's, there's a, a, a lot of topography across the site. And so there are also upper entrances into atria spaces in both, at, at both of those entrances. So Roper Lane would come down and enter the building at, an, at a level two and the plaza here would be level one. Similarly, on the west side, there'll be an entrance into EEB, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, at the upper level here, through an atrium, down to the connection to the plaza level here. The commons as well has lower entrances on the west and on the east, and then you'll see sets of stairs that come up one level uh, to the second level, and there's another entrance to the commons at that point. That particular entrance ties into the Roper Lane pathway that goes, got, goes through the site here. Um, the landscape then continues through what we call a grove that would be between the future ELE building and the BioE building that uh, creates an accessible pathway. We really wanted to create an accessible pathway through the entire site. And that's the kind of long diagonal required for an accessible uh, pathway that then arrives at a um, quadrangle uh, for a new, a new home, a new place of identity for the School of Engineering and a passageway through a portal uh, through the CBE building past some additional sunken gardens on this side. Those gardens are sunken so that we can push the, the CBE building down into the ground and minimize the height of that building as it begins to approach uh, Prospect Avenue. And then you'll see uh, at the northern end of that CBE building, uh, what we call the Theorist Pavilion. And that Theorist Pavilion is very carefully designed to have the same setback that is typical of the clubs on, um, on Prospect. So it's very respectful of that setback. And also if you look at just the volume of the building, it's a two-story building that would be you know very similar in its volume and massing to all of the buildings here it does have a different kind of landscape uh, and this we've, we've had some comments about uh, our thinking behind that landscape and i think that the best way to describe that landscape is that in contrast to the eating clubs which have shrubs or walls that create a kind of sense of privacy and uh, a kind of home uh, we wanted this to be open, inviting, and um, uh, a kind of community space. We didn't want to, there to be any ambiguity that when you got to here, you were welcomed not only to seize and environmental studies, but you're welcomed into the campus. So this becomes a kind of gateway entrance into the campus at that eastern end. It also terminates that configuration of eating clubs because it's located at the far uh, eastern end of that. And so it can afford a slightly different kind of landscape, but fundamentally, this is about a, a welcoming environment for, for the community, created a, a kind of shaded orchard of trees that make the landscape in, in that particular area. If we continue around the backs of the properties, um, uh, the, the clubs between the clubs and environmental studies, 
Um, this again would be like a campus setting. Our, our campus buildings do not have fronts and backs. Uh, they're meant to be perceived and experienced and accessed from all sides. And so you'll see here uh, a set of pathways. I'll describe a little bit later some of those pathways. Uh, groves of trees that provide a, a, a wonderful buffer to the southern side of the, the clubs. Uh, gathering spaces that are set within those areas uh, for the academic users, and uh, all in all, a kind of campus setting throughout the, the northern side in the landscape between the new development and uh, the existing clubs on Prospect Avenue. So that just gives you a little bit of thinking of the overall development of the site. I want to talk a little bit about circulation, uh, starting with vehicular circulation. We all know that Roper Lane right now is a uh, provides vehicular access from Prospect down to Ivy Lane. And we're proposing we want to take that functionality of Roper Lane and relocate it to the eastern end, end of the site. And the purpose there is that um, going back to the value proposition and some of our objectives, uh, in order to create a contiguous uh, environment where researchers, faculty, students can can walk uh, from one end of the building to the other end of the building complex indoors um, uh, in, in, uh, in conditioned space. We didn't want to have to have a street go through that uh, and dividing that, that neighborhood. So we're taking the functionality of Roper Lane, moving it to the far eastern end of the site. It also has the advantage of enhancing the, the setback to the, the homes that are on uh, Fitz Randolph. And I'll, I'll show you later, we have uh, three rows of trees and a significant setback from that property line in order to um, again create a landscape buffer at, at uh, that edge of the site. What Roper Lane will become is uh, a limited access vehicular drive but more importantly a shared street. Uh, we think that um, this will be another campus walk for people who want to bypass uh, the project and head, head uh, in that area. Um, for uh, as all of our campus walks are for um, pedestrians and cyclists and the limited access for the vehicles will provide access to the Ivy Club and to Cannon Club, which currently enjoy access from uh, the backs of their properties and that we're, we're going to maintain that access to the back of, of their properties. So this would be, uh, as I said, limited access, but really a kind of a pedestrian friendly pathway uh, that we call uh, Leafy Lane. And the, the North South Connector, the other role that that plays is that provides a, a service entry to a fully subterranean uh, and shielded loading dock. Uh, that's also the waste transfer station for, for the site, but it's also a place, to, place of deliveries. So that'll be the primary uh, delivery center for the entire complex. There's a delivery corridor that picks up at that point and feeds into CBE and then uh, moves along the northern edge of all of these buildings connecting environmental studies um, to BioE to CBE and would even then have when ELE is built, there'll be another tunnel connecting to, to ELE. So all the servicing can happen out of sight and back of house through this um, uh, subterranean loading dock that is accessed off of the new north-south connector. Then layering in some more of the pedestrian pathways, you'll see these are, are coincident with Leafy Lane because that's really a pedestrian and bicycle environment. You'll see them continuing along the northern side of the site. And then you'll see uh, the pathways that come through portals or between spaces between the buildings uh, or through atria here, as I explained earlier, creating a, a network of pedestrian connections throughout the site. Some of them are fully public. You don't have to be a member of the university community. Uh, you would come through that portal just as you experience the rest of the campus to, through an accessible pathway and down an accessible pathway and another little accessible route, route that's not shown in this diagram but connects down to Ivan and Western Way. If you choose to go through building lobbies, as I mentioned, there are both stairs and elevators. So those are uh, accessible through the elevators. Uh, uh, that will get you through the, through the site. We are also importantly converting Roper Lane right now. We're modifying Roper Lane. It is currently not ADA compliant and we're going to adjust the, the contours along that street to make that ADA compliant so that there could be an ADA pathway that comes through Roper between the environmental studies and BioE building. Uh, there would be stairs uh, available at the on that pathway, but also a disabled uh, pathway that comes to here, picks up on that diagonal through the grove, 
and then takes the, takes the accessible pathways down to Ivor Lane and Western Way. So we've been very attentive to those pathways. And then you'll see they all then um, can combine along Ivor Lane and Western Way to connect to the existing campus, which will feed into the network of pathways there or around the stadium and, and tie into, into the major pathways of the campus uh, in this area. So multiple entrances, a lot of porosity, a lot of connectivity, and really a kind of open and welcoming uh, part of the campus for the community. We will, uh, we're working with James Corner Field Operations. I think uh, you're familiar that James Corner Field Operations is the landscape architect for all of the projects that we're doing in this generation of uh, construction. And the landscapes are designed to um, continue campus traditions of, uh, of creating wonderful landscape settings for our architecture, places for people to gather, places of reflection, places that are uh, multi-seasonal and uh, sort of inspire uh, learning and community and serve both um, uh, contemporary buildings uh, and historic buildings. So there's, there's, there's a very nice landscape tradition that we're gonna continue. And you saw that on that, that orientation slide that I showed of the overall neighborhood. Uh, if we look at a three-dimensional view of the site, um, this shows you the stadium in the foreground, Washington Road on the left, Prospect Avenue on the upper part, and the eating clubs. Uh, you'll see here, uh, here's that, uh, that piece of the CBE building that steps down to form a volume that's consistent with the volume of those eating clubs. Um, there's a significant change of grade, as everybody knows, from Prospect down to Ivy Lane. And so these buildings uh, are one level uh, taller on the lower side than they are on the upper side, which means they have less less presence uh, at the back side of the eating clubs, which we think is, is is an opportunity to take advantage of. And then on the southern side, you'll see this um, meandering uh, and rather picturesque form. It again um, breaks down the uh, the building into a set of pieces that are smaller scaled uh, and more part of the tradition and of forms of buildings on the campus. And here you can see the Commons building, which is pulled out as a bit of a landmark or a beacon surrounded by landscapes on Ivy Lane and Western Way. Here's that arrival plaza for environmental studies, the diagonal grove that leads up to the uh, quad for School of Engineering, the future site for ELE at the southeast corner. Roper Lane comes through here. Uh, these are the connections through the atria that I talked about. So you can enter that atria on level two and go down to level one and come out here. Likewise, you could uh, come off um, this pathway through the landscape and enter an atria here and come down to that, that plaza here. So a lot of connectivity throughout the site. Just a few early sketchy renderings of the site to give you a better, better sense of some things from a, the perspective of an individual walking through the campus. We're now looking at the uh, at the eastern end of the site, you can see a key plan here in the upper right of the, of the drawing, looking south toward Western Way. This is the setback from uh, the, the backside of the property of the neighbors on um, uh, uh, Fitz Randolph. You'll see the three rows of trees that create a kind of nice landscape buffer between uh, the community there and uh, our first buildings here. And this is the Theorist Pavilion, which is, as I said, stepped down to fit the scale of the uh, eating clubs. If we continue then, um, this is uh, the, the orchard uh, in front of that theorist pavilion on Prospect. And this is a, it gives you a good sense of what I was talking about. The contrast between the privacy and the sense of an enclave that are created by the eating clubs, which are more inward looking, and our attempt here to effort to use landscape to really signal a welcoming environment when it's open to the community and welcomes everybody into the project, uh, into the campus and creates a kind of gateway into this, this uh, now our eastern end of, of the campus and then connecting to that network of pathways that would bring people to the rest of the campus. So we're really a place for people, a more public space uh, in this area. This is the Theorist Pavilion, part of that CVE project, two stories tall that fits the volume and setback of the eating clubs. Here's the portal. Uh, through the three-story tall building plus a penthouse of the CBE building. If you go through that portal, um, you'll arrive in the, the quad area for the School of Engineering. Uh, as you did that, if you went through that, you would be on this bridge. So we're looking back toward Prospect. This is a bridge over a sunken garden. Uh, you see that the volume just in a simple diagram of the theorist pavilion facing on the Prospect. 
and here's the that wing of the CVE building that, that as I said, is pushed down into the landscape to minimize the presence of that building. Uh, so there's uh, three stories above uh, the sort of uh, north-south connector here and the, and the penthouse. And then you see the, the landscape of that orchard and a really wonderful sunken garden here that'll be uh, accessible, uh, uh, like some of the, like the gardens at uh, the Anlinger Center. This is looking down into that that courtyard uh, surrounded by the, the, the CBE building. Here you are coming through that portal that I mentioned. So we've come through a portal here. Uh, we're looking back a little bit to the north and west at uh, three-story and four-story pieces of the Bio E building. This would be the new quad that uh, would give identity to the School of Engineering on this eastern part of the site. And you'll see this bicycle here just beginning to go down the accessible ramp, which goes through that grove down toward um, Ivy Lane and Western Way. So here's that same uh, fellow uh, enjoying his accessible pathway down toward Ivy Lane and Western Way. This pathway here peels off. This is the accessible route that connects to the new accessible Roper Lane, again, through this landscape down toward the sta stadium and Ivy Lane. To the left here is just simply a, a, a kind of placeholder for the position of the ELE building, which, as I said, would, is, a, is a, a next phase of development. As all of those pathways arrive, both stairs and ramps, uh, they arrive down at uh, Ivy Lane and Western Way here. You'll see the Commons building uh, here and a kind of mid-level plaza that gives entrance to the Commons and also to the lower level of the Bio E building. And some early sketches of the transformation of um, uh, uh, Ivy Lane and Western Way. We're really um, uh, encouraged by the opportunity to keep the building open to the public, but create a, um, a shared street, a complete street with, with advisory shoulders. Uh, we will control the speed limit on that. We really will want to make it a, a safe environment. So we haven't set the speed limit, but it's probably closer to 10 or 15 miles an hour. So that the, there's very limited traffic that uses that street, particularly with the relocation of the parking garage and the removal of all of the parking lots on the street. And so we really want to create a kind of welcoming environment on, on that street. And here's the, again, as I said, the kind of uh, beacon of the uh, Commons building that uh, is featured on, on Ivy Lane. Um, now I'm going to take a step back and show some of the sections to this. Area. I talked about the, the topography, this upper section shows uh, at the left here, Prospect Avenue. This happens to be taken through a cottage club. Uh, as you can see uh, down the hill, the mass of the um, uh, Environmental Studies building, Leafy Lane here, which is in the landscape between the Environmental Studies buildings and the backside of the Eating Club properties. But the tops of the clubs are more or less at the midpoint of uh, this penthouse level here. So it's not a significant uh, uh, increase in, in the height of the neighborhood. And, and that's all uh, facilitated again by taking advantage of the slopes and pressing the buildings down into the ground, uh, which then open up onto the landscape uh, in front of the buildings and, and uh, Ivy Lane here. This is, uh, we looked at this already once before. This is that section looking back toward Prospect with uh, Fitzrandolph off to the side here. Uh, pedestrians uh, on Fitzrandolph, if their sight lines over the houses would not even see these buildings. So they're, they're well protected from the visibility from Fitzrandolph there. This now coming back into some of the views through the, through the site. Here we are on Roper Lane, uh, looking uh, to the south. Uh, as I mentioned, we're making Roper Lane fully accessible now with uh, the bioengineering building on the left, the environmental studies building on the right, and this is the pedestrian pathway that would come into the Commons building um, as one option that could enter the Commons and take that stairs or elevators down to the lower level, to level one, or uh, pedestrians could peel off to the right and uh, take the stairs down to Ivy Lane or to the left to the um, accessible pathway that um, connects to the Grove and comes down an accessible route toward Ivy Lane. Uh, the arrival plaza for environmental studies off of Ivy Lane, you can see on the key plan here, this is the uh, plaza that um, has lower level entrances into the atria for ecology and evolutionary biology, EEB over here. Entrance right here would be the lower level of the atrium for uh, Princeton Environmental Institute and geosciences. And as, I, as I've mentioned, each of those atria uh, has stairs and elevators that come up to the second level 
and then access the, uh, the site on the upper level. And then at the um, uh, far western end of the site, uh, looking back to the east, you can see the transformation of Iden in the Western Way and the scale and configuration of the buildings that would be on the northern side of, of that street and uh, the kind of environment that we imagine, uh, uh, which is, a, as I said, a complete street and a, a sort of uh, pedestrian friendly environment. So to talk a little bit about uh, sustainability, uh, these are the action areas from our sustainability action plan. Everything from um, our uh, goal to reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions to zero by 2046, uh, but also water usage, stormwater management, uh, inc increasing sustainable transportation options. You've heard me mention several times the kind of environment that we want to create that fosters bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, reducing waste, designing responsibly. I should have said that we take a passive design first approach to all the architecture and we're again fortunate because of the orientation of the site that the buildings can uh, have optimum passive design strategies and to cultivate healthy and resilient habitats. We, we will, as we move through the sort of refinement of the project, we'll share a lot more information about the sustainability measures. Um, I don't imagine this, this legend is, is particularly legible in this presentation, but um, this shows again the, the passive design strategies, taking advantage of opportunities for shading southern glass um, and through through uh, overhangs and scrims. Um, we will use a triple glazing, uh, a high performance envelope. Uh, the the office wings. Uh, in each of these buildings. It's a combination of laboratory wings and office wings. The office wings in all of these buildings will be will utilize mass timber. So um, uh, they'll have embodied carbon and they will basically represent an ethos of sustainability that will carry a message that's appropriate and significant for environmental study and the school of engineering. You'll see uh, green roofs um, and, um, and stormwater management throughout the site. So there's a host of environmental strategies that will go into this. There'll be um, that we can uh, go into in detail now or as we as we develop the rest of the project. These are photographs of uh, uh, strategies for best practice design, low impact design uh, that are being incorporated into design, including green roofs, uh, biosoils with planted woodlands, bioretention, and uh, this, this project will have the opportunity to have uh, to tie into the regional stormwater uh, management at the, at the soccer stadium. Uh, so that is, um, I think, the final slide in the presentation. Um, and uh, so I hope this is a thorough introduction. We're certainly, we have a, a number of members of the, of the team here who have a lot of expertise and we're um, available to answer any questions that you might have about the presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just so that we can all see each other and then I'll go back and pull up images or plans um, as needed. Sounds good. Um, wow, that's a lot to take in. <laughs> it's it's uh, so impressive in many ways. Um, I guess I would uh, ask uh, planning board members, Mr. Cohen, I saw you begin to raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. um, please, please go I, ahead. Yeah, I'm always impatient. <laughs> I get my two cents in. I actually love this project. I think it's very, um, very beautiful and uh, responsible. And, um, but I do have a, just a couple of questions. One is the uh, residences that are along the north-south connector. Are those owned by the university? The ones that are closest, not the ones that are right on Fitzrandolph, but the ones that are closest. Uh, one of them is a head of college house for the university, and the others uh, are in our uh, faculty ownership program. Uh, so you know they are they're owned by the faculty technically, but in an arrangement mm -hmm. with the university. Okay. And the other question I had across from the, the plaza that's semi-enclosed by the um, Environmental Sciences Building, there's an existing low rectangular building. I can't remember what- That's astrophysics. That's okay. astrophysics building. Yeah. Um, to, to me, it feels like it's uh, the recipient of a lot of pressure 
to sort of keep up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's going to continue there. Do you think it has the presence to um, occupy that that space across from the plaza yeah. there? Uh, if you look at our 2026 campus plan, which looks out 30 years, that site is identified as a future opportunity site, a site of transformation. Um, it's inevitable that as um, the campus evolves um, so that we avoid sprawl, that we have a little bit higher density. And the astrophysics buildings of you know, a one, one, one story with a, a sort of semi-basement. And um, uh, we would imagine that that would be a, an opportunity site. Uh, so it's not, that one story building will not, would not be there for, you know, I don't, we haven't put a date on it, but that's not gonna be a long-term building. Okay. And so this, this neighborhood will change. Um, uh, there are future growth sites on the south side of Ivan the Western Way for the other elements of uh, the School of Engineering that will move down to this neighborhood. Chemical and biological engineering will move down eventually. Um, uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering, aeronautical engineering will move down to this, to this neighborhood. And so there will be more, more development. All that is indicated as future development in our, mm -hmm. in our, in our uh, 2026 uh, campus plan. Okay. I have nothing bad to say. I have a question. Sure. Um, it, it goes to the type of architecture that you're thinking about for the site, the actual materials and that sort of thing, how you, buildings will be expressed. It seems from these re early renderings that it'll be mostly glass and uh, metal and some more, a very contemporary, almost corporate look. It kind of reminds me of some of the more, the newer buildings around the ellipse over on the, you know, east, uh, west of Washington Road. Mm -hmm. um, some of the laboratory buildings. Is that mm -hmm. the nature of this? Will there be any sort of more traditional materials or will that be in the landscaping or in how the plazas and green spaces are designed? It's a, that's a good question. I think, um, I think you're right. This will be a, a contemporary building. We like to say that most of, the, most of the campus buildings are of their time, particularly when you think about uh, research buildings. Um, we are struggling with uh, Geo Hall, which is a collegiate Gothic building that's been <laughs> abused as we've tried to squeeze modern research into that building. Um, but but uh, other than that, as one exception, uh, our research buildings, our contemporary buildings started in the 60s and continuing to today. And so this would be, would be in that tradition. I would say that what we've learned, what the campus has learned over time, what architecture has learned over time, is that contemporary buildings can be much better neighbors. They can adjust their scale, they can adjust their form, they can, they can inhabit uh, landscapes that, are, that pick up traditions from the campus making. Uh, and, so, and so this would be informed and is informed in the design by, by um, our, our, you know, the ability of modern architecture to be more sensitive to context and neighbors and site and things like that. Uh, more specifically to your point, uh, there, there are um, uh, the, the buildings to have a stone base that is picking up the tradition of uh, schist stone, which is part of the campus tradition. So there will be elements of stone, um, uh, very, very prominent at the ground level of the buildings. And then um, in the upper levels, uh, masonry, brick, uh, particularly um, uh, on those office wings, which will be, um, uh, as I said, mass timber construction, and then um, uh, clad, in, clad in brick. And the, the masonry tradition goes back to the collegiate Gothic, Gothic era as well. So the materiality of the buildings, I'd say, brings forward um, materials that are part of the campus and makes simply contemporary buildings with, with those materials. I'd also say that one of the really exciting things is that um, the, the, the buildings facing everything in the Western Way, which will be mass timber, have generous windows and we're with the lighting designers and the architectural team, the lighting strategy um, will um, uh, feature the warmth of that wood uh, at night and dusk as you look into the building. So it'll be um, uh, really, really wonderful. Uh, uh, that'll introduce a new material to the campus, a protected wood material, uh, which will give it a kind of warmth and uh, I, I think a really special character to this neighborhood. That, also, that commons, that commons building is uh, all, the, the ceilings in the commons building are framed in mass timber as well. The structure's mass timber. 
there's some spaces in there that are spectacular. And the outside in view of those mass timber volumes and the warmth of, of, of them uh, will be really, really wonderful. Yeah, that's really good to hear because it'll, this complex will certainly relate to what's across Ivy Lane, which is the stadium, in mm -hmm. addition to that smaller building. And the stadium is, is very sort of austere and, and, you know, when it's not full of people. <laughs> mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it, to really enliven Ivy Lane and make it a, a people friendly place and warm, I, I'm glad you're thinking of those. Things. Yeah, the scale, the texture, it wants to have, um, although it's a contemporary building, it's a, it's a rational building, it wants to be a flexible building, has functional floor to floor heights. It, it'll have um, a lot of detail and care in the making of the building. I'm looking at our architects and they're making, they're promising me that it'll have all that. <laughs> We'll remember that. Thank you. <laughs> Louise, I don't think we can hear you. I can, I can see your oh. lips moving, but I cannot hear you. <laughs> now we can. Yeah. Now we can. <laughs> we heard you for a second. I've been having trouble with my audio. That works. Now you're yep. now I can. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Um, can you explain um, more about the term and uh, mass timber and what that what that means, how that plays out? I'm just not familiar with it, and I'd like to understand it better. I'd love to explain it, but I'm going to give. Um, our architects. Emily, do you want to take that question and uh, uh, give an answer? Sure. Um, so with, uh, with laboratory buildings, we have a lot of requirements for the structure. However, for the office part of the structure that doesn't contain the actual research labs, uh, we were able to look at um, using mass timber. And there are a couple of different uh, types of wood construction that that entails. But what we're using are uh, wood columns and uh, then a system called a dowel laminated uh, floor panels. So they're um, pieces of wood that are placed like this next to each other and then laminated through with dowels. So they become a, a thick wood sandwich. And then a concrete slab is poured on top of that. It gives it its, um, its, uh, its fire rating. And so it functions a lot like a traditional steel with concrete slab on top of it. But uh, it, it sequesters carbon and it also is its own material. We don't have to uh, fireproof it and we don't have to wrap it in drywall and paint it and things like that. So uh, throughout the building you'll see um, exposed columns that will be wood. So even though you're in a lab building it'll have that warmth um, and that sort of materiality. Um, we thought that was very important for the environmental studies building but we also think it's really important for the biological engineering building and the the chemical engineering building you know this is important for everybody no matter what your your research uh, uh, focus is so uh, we're very excited to be able to to bring this in you know it'll be in the offices you'll see it from the from the street as Ron described and uh, you'll just have that um, close association with the natural material throughout the building and this process of using laminations with dowels uh, results in a super strong and stable material so it's not uh, Big heavy pieces of timber that are that you know from from old 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 lumber old old right. old forest lumber. These are uh, su sustainably uh, forested and uh, into into laminated layers. A little bit better. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> um, are there uh, do other board members or staff, anybody have additional questions? Okay, I have one more and maybe it is something to address uh, later on when when the application is before us, but I'm interested to, to know more about um, the landscaping and what um, what you do in this era of rapid climate change to make sure that when you're putting in um, you know such an ambitious project with so many trees it's got so much water to soak up what do you do to make sure that those trees can get as big as they're meant to be assuming they're meant to get big 
<laughs> as, as trees are, you know, on, on all the rest of the campus. So again, not something we need to go into in a lot of detail today, but I, I would love to understand that when the time comes. Well, we, we have uh, our landscape arch architect, uh, Tatiana Chuliku, who's a principal in James Corner Field Operations. And I think, Tatiana, you can answer that a little bit. And I'd like you to, to talk beginning with soils uh, and the work that we do to think about soils uh, and, and uh, their ability to, to foster the kinds of trees that we want. But I'll let you uh, respond to that question. Yeah, um, so I just want to frame the question again. You're talking about this, how big the trees are going to get? I, uh, I guess I do have a question about how big um, the trees, you know, whether the intent is to plant the, the kinds of trees that ultimately can and will get very big, um, as, as is seen so in so many other places on campus. And it, if, if that is the case, you know, how do you, how do you plan for that? And if that is not the case, whether you're planning to do, you know, lots and lots of smaller the renderings that I saw, you know, the, the sizes of the trunks were relatively, you know, small and yet the trees looked as if they were mature, I, you know. I'm okay, um, so the goal is for us to create a very diverse um, palette of vegetation that is native to the state of New Jersey and more specifically to Mercer County. And this includes a variety of trees, shrubs, ground covers, grasses, ferns, bulbs, all of the above. So it's not just going to be only trees. Um, the trees will come in very different sizes. Some will be straight trunks, uh, others will be multiple trunks. Uh, some will be tall and others will be short, um, but as um, Ron said, because we're going to build this very large building, we're going to start from the bottom. We're going to have to create soil <laughs> and build it up from the bottom. So uh, we have a soil scientist on our team. They are very, very good, very famous. They've been working for us for a long time. And what they're, they're doing is all the soil that is being stripped from the different sites under construction, they're gonna take that, they've been analyzing it and then adding what is needed to it, such as organic matter or whatever sand, so that it's, um, it can support life, very healthy life for a very long time. Uh, keep moisture in it, etc. And so this all this native vegetation will grow well, healthy, and then will provide habitat as you as uh, uh, Ron listed in the uh, sustainability action plan. That's a big goal of the university and the landscape is the place where habitat will be provided and provide diversity for all sorts of wildlife and plants and provide shade in the summer and sun in the winter by dropping the leaves, which is typical to the native um, ecology of the region. And we're focusing all the plants to be, um, to have seasonal variety. So it doesn't look the same all year long. Yeah. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but hopefully I did. I think you did. I would just add one, one, one detail is that relatively, almost most of the landscape is in soil, not on top of structure. Around the commons uh -huh. building, you are on top of structure. And because you're on top of structure there, you have less volume for soil. And therefore the, the trees will be specified to be healthy in that environment. But those are not gonna be super large trees when they're sitting on top of a yeah, structure yeah, beneath. Definitely. Right, okay, got it. I think, I think Michael Laplace had a question, did I? Yes, thank you, Ron. Um, I did have one more question, and it relates to the property, the Ivy Club property. Um, yes. As I stated earlier, there's going to be a subdivision that has to take place in order to assemble this site for the new project. It's the southern end of, end of the Ivy Club, which has an access off of Ivy Lane. And there's a very attractive brick wall and some gates that um, they're right across from the Peyton Hall. And mm -hmm. it's just yeah. a very attractive feature. I yeah. was wondering yeah. if the university is working with the Ivy Club to perhaps preserve that and maybe move or reconstruct the, the gates in the wall somewhere else? 
The Ivy Club is um, proposing to rebuild um, a brick wall um, to match that wall. I don't know the details of the plan. I've, we've seen their concepts for their new southern property after the land subdivision, uh, which would be facing uh, Leafy Lane. Mm -hmm. They want to rebuild a, that a brick wall. I think as a replica of what the either you know as a replica of what's there now, including the gate posts that are there now. So they want they want to they really want to have a nice entrance to their southern edge of their property with a with a. I'd say I think it's a, I think it's a new brick wall. Um, that, but it's a replica of what's there, what's there now. Hmm. Okay, thank you. That sounds good. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Do we, I don't see that there are questions in Q&A. Um, and I um, can't say that I know for sure, David, you're muted. I can't say that I know for sure whether with the concept plan we take comments from the public anyway, but I don't see that anyone. There's one hand <laughs> raised. Please. Ah, okay, excuse me. I'm not seeing that. Clifford Zink. Do you want to? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I can yeah. turn, uh, I'm Clifford, I'm going to bring you in as a panelist because uh, Jerry, our attorney, likes to have, likes to see your face when you're testifying. <laughs> <laughs> see if you can see my video. Okay. So is it correct? I, I remember you're saying Jerry, before that you would not be um, swearing people in because um, this is a concept plan. Is that, I have that right, correct? That's, that's correct. And what we traditionally do when there are concept plans is we certainly let the public uh, speak if they wish. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, now I've lost you on my screen, Mr. Zink. <laughs> uh, I can see my- It's on the second. Go right ahead, please. I can see myself at the top. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question or a comment to share? I have a comment. Uh, so uh, I'd like to congratulate the university on its uh, sustainable plans for the whole project. Uh, in addition to the landscaping, uh, particularly the mass timber, which is still a relatively new uh, type of construction. So that's very laudable that they're doing that. Um, the main reason I'd like to uh, say something is that uh, I'm concerned about the introduction of the new construction along Prospect Avenue. Um, I live just a few blocks away from there. And I also wrote a book uh, called The Princeton Eating Clubs. And uh, that section of the south side of Prospect Avenue is in the Princeton Historic District, which is on both the state and national register. And that section extends from Washington Road all the way to Fitz Randolph. And so uh, the new construction uh, that's going to be in place of what is now the Office of the Dean for Research, uh, that building used to be a court club, which is the last of 11 uh, eating clubs that line that entire side of Prospect Avenue. And so the university is proposing uh, replacing that. And I think that's going to have a, uh, a, a negative impact on the uh, historic landscape of, of uh, Prospect Avenue. And it will destroy one of the iconic eating clubs uh, that that particular building has been there since 1928. And um, that whole area across the street from there, there are three little historic houses. And then of course, all the Fitz Randolph buildings are historic. And so uh, I can see why the university wants to have access there to um, Prospect Avenue. 
But I, I can't, and I appreciate the fact, as Ron said, that they want to keep the building that will face prospect to have the same setback and also to be two stories in height on that area. And I also understand uh, how he is saying, well, we'd like to differentiate the entrance here with a grove of trees. But uh, I don't, th I think the way it's designed right now will have a negative impact on the historic character of that end of Prospect Avenue. And um, the town of Princeton back in the 1990s uh, undertook a study to, uh, to designate the entire strip of Prospect Avenue along there on both sides as a local, uh, local landmark. And there's a whole study about that and about the significance of all those eating clubs. And at the time, it was decided not to pursue that. But the bottom line is that that whole stretch of the street is very historic. And so um, uh, some other person, some alumni of the university involved with the eating clubs have suggested, why not preserve the facade and perhaps the whole front section of court club and the university can still have its two entrances or maybe one entrance that would combine cars and pedestrians on one side of that. Uh, and maybe there would be some other ways to signal that this is part of going down to the CEASE campus. But uh, I don't think that the design as it's currently uh, proposed of either the building or the landscape is compatible with the, uh, with the historic district that lines the south side of Prospect Avenue. And I'd like to ask the university to take a further look at that and seriously consider preserving uh, Court Club as part, of the, uh, as part of the historic landscape of that entire street. We will continue certainly to look at that uh, further. We are, our proposal is to, is to uh, what we call Bopes Tall, is to move it across the street and preserve the building uh, as, the, as the home for the um, uh, Office for the Dean for Research. So, so Bopes Hall is the one that's adjacent to it. I don't think you're, you, you want to preserve Bopes Hall, yes? Yes. Okay, so now moving the, um, moving a very large brick building like that has got to be a very, very big expense. Uh, so aside from whatever the university would pay to move it, um, if you move it across the street, you're going to be destroying at least two, and you'll probably want to destroy all three of the little historic houses that are across the street. And I, ask, I would ask people on the planning board to take a ride down there and walk around there and look at the historic landscape there. And um, one of those buildings, the one at 110 Prospect Avenue, which is right next to the garage, that is a former eating club that was moved to that site uh, in 1923 when Key and Seal Club, which is now Bops Hall, uh, when it built its current brick building, it sold the building and it was a person bought it and moved it across the street. So that is another historic eating club. And so if you move uh, what was Court Club or the Office of Dean of Research now, if you move that across the street in an effort to save it, you'll be destroying um, another historic resource in the town. And I think the, you know, the eating clubs are a unique set of buildings. There are many fraternity houses in many uh, college towns all over the country, but Princeton is unique and it has all these eating clubs lined up in one row. And the development of those buildings uh, over 30 or 40 years, 100 years ago, um, what we see now is, um, is really, uh, you know, it's, it's an iconic representation of, of um, undergraduate life at Princeton. And it's a very important uh, streetscape for the city, for the town of Princeton. 
And so I think, um, I, again, I think the university should, should reconsider introducing, uh, you know, a new design, which in my opinion is incompatible with the historic character. And it really doesn't meet the guidelines of introducing new construction in historic districts, uh, such as this one, which is on the National Register. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll also do some research about the, the designation. I don't think that the, these buildings are on the National Register. If you'd like to um, share, could I share my screen? Is that possible? Um, do you have just uh, an image or two? I, I, I just would show you the historic district boundaries because I have, um, uh, I don't know if I can actually do this, but I, I have the historic district boundaries pulled up on New Jersey GeoWeb. I don't know if you'd allow me to share the screen. I don't, we can report back when we come to the planning board and we can, we can address all the historic issues uh, of, the, of the designations, the boundaries, the register, things like that. Okay, and Mr. Zink, if you can um, provide what you were going to share on your screen to the planning office and um, as uh, Mr. McCoy said, um, they will address those those questions when they come back to us with um, with an application. But in the meantime, the planning office will have access to what you wanted to share with us. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd, we'd appreciate having that information. And I'll bring our historic preservation officer, Elizabeth Kim, into the discussion as well. So I'd be happy to meet uh, you and Elizabeth out there, uh, Michael, and take a look at, um, at you know, at the, at the uh, Office of Dean of Research and the potential impact of uh, either destroying it or moving it and introducing a new building there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank so, you. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we certainly have, as you know, the university has a, a, a number of consultants and including historic consultants that have looked at this and have evaluated it. So we can come back at one time, um, you know, maybe with our site plan and talk about our presentation and the research we've done. Just to be clear, it is not within the historic district in Princeton. It may be listed on a register on a national level, but um, it's not, it's definitely not a landmark, not a landmark site locally, just to be clear. Um, and we do have a number of um, uh, historic consultants and we'll be happy to gather that information and, and make a, an, a, a good presentation next time we're before the board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, is anyone else uh, in line to ask questions? No, or? no, no their hands up. Okay. Um, well, as always, thank you, um, Mr. DeGrezia, Mr. McCoy, and the whole um, university team. Um, it, does the, do members of the board or staff have any other questions? Okay. Then I think I could entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present our plan this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks bye -bye. very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. The next week.